All right, let me bring uh, Dave up. To the stage. Okay, well, um, now I will say, let me just go back. I have, I have this somewhere. Oh, here it is. So it's one nothing Cubs in the top of the second. Are you happy or are you not happy? You know, I th this year I have not been able to follow much of anything. I ended up um, with a wonderful bundle of joy that my wife gets wow. to take oh. care of. So I I am happy to have an hour by myself, but well, an hour with all of you also. Mm -hmm. So uh, so that, that I have to say, you know, you only get one through each each child childhood. Um, enjoy it. It's really it, you know it's one of the best things in the world. I'm sure you're I'm sure you're enjoying it. Because you yeah, must no, love kids because you're, you know, you went into the teaching yeah. because you like kids, right? Yeah, it, well, I mean, I sure didn't go into it for the money, and I'm sure everybody can relate to that here. Right, right. I, that I, is I safe for all of us. So that's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so why don't I bring myself down, and I'll bring your slides up, and um, you can call me up if, if you need me, okay? Okay, sounds great. Okay, everybody. So my name um, is Dave Blanchard, and today we're going to be talking about um, what happens next. And we're going to be focusing on some robotics and some programming. And what that all boils down to is computer science. I'm actually going to pop this down. Can everybody see that fine? Go ahead and uh, just... Terry, give you... Terry, could you give me a thumbs up? Oh, Terry must not have her headphones on this very second, but we'll go ahead and start there. Um, so I am a 21st skills and technology teacher, so I'm a specialist teacher within a 3-5 building, and I also teach a couple of primary classes um, just in the mix. Um, I work in Cambridge Isani School, so we're about an hour north of the Twin Cities, if you're familiar with Minnesota at all. And then I do have my Twitter handle and my blog um, address right there. One thing that I'm really fortunate to be able to do this year is to um, join with ClassFlow as an ambassador and be able to share some really great components of class flow. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump to the next slide and we are actually gonna be joining class flow today. And the reason why I'm using class flow tonight is because I wanna provide you an experience similar to what my students have experienced when I introduce some new topics. So what you can do is you can actually click on the link um, inside of our ed chat window right here on Shindig. Otherwise you can go to classflow.com backslash student with a lowercase s. And then you're going to see a screen that looks very similar to my little Mac here with um, a join class. And you're going to enter in the code Q3L3F. And you'll put your name and click join anyways. So I can see I have one person in. And I really do want to encourage people to go ahead and take a moment to do this. Um, it's definitely going to be something kind of neat where we're going to be able to see um, on two different browser windows or tabs, some really interesting new things. I'm going to pop back up, but uh, I know we had a question from one of the people who is uh, using um, a tablet, and unfortunately, if you're using on an iPad or an Android, and I think on a Chromebook as well, you can't use the messaging feature. All you can do is really ask me questions. Um, I'm sorry, um, but there is some interaction there. And I and I'll say that uh, there was a question, Lisa. You know, while people are going to class, uh, class flow, is um, Lisa said she would like educators to understand STEM. Is not an add-on, but instead, but instead, could be naturally blended into into it. So, okay, I'm going to bring myself yeah, back and down. And I'll bring your slides back up. Lisa, Lisa, I completely agree. Um, in the school setting that um, I'm, we have some teachers integrating it in some different ways and and really um, making their curriculum come alive with that. But we also have some educators who are still a little timid. So one aspect of my job that, that I really enjoy, get our students ready with something and being able to get our teachers ready with, and then kind of doing a pre-training in my class, getting the students comfortable, and then shifting things into a classroom setting so that they can also um, work 
in the classroom. And that really helps by reducing some of the um, anxiety a teacher might have by needing to explain things. So I have about 12 people in our ClassFo class. So um, once again, that code was Q3L3F. Um, and we're going to go ahead and uh, move on to our next slide because I definitely want to have tonight going. Um, today, what we're really talking about is um, the discussion of popular tools for integrating robotics, programming, and computer science into our classrooms, focusing in this K-8 area. If you want to flip it to the next slide, what this boils down to is computer science. And I think that not enough people see um, the, the true um, validity, validity behind this and that computer science isn't this thing that's taught in some other class. And it can be, um, but it's something that we can really integrate into our um, areas where we have our, our standard content areas going on. So we'll go ahead and jump to our next slide. Um, I've got a video for us. And one thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to also send this video. So if you are on um, ClassFlow also, you can go ahead and um, see it. your screen just changed. And that's one really neat aspect of ClassFlow. And you're seeing a slide very similar to the slide that I've presented here. Um, if you are not on um, a, a second device or, or a second tab, you can actually click into this link. Um, and we're going to watch just a little piece of this video. Um, so we're going to spend about two minutes on this video. So if we could go ahead and watch that right now. OK, so I am pulling that card if you're following along on ClassFlow. And everybody else, if you could go ahead and um, pause that video. Um, I saw a couple of comments that made me really smile about how people have already played this students this video for their students. Um, and this is a video pulled right from um, code.org that's used a lot in the hour of code. And there are a couple of things that I want to point out with this video. The first one um, is that the nine people that you see on, on our screen here in Shindig have nine very different backgrounds nine very different careers and nine very different futures. But there's one commonality in that they all have been and have engaged with um, some aspect of computer science. The other piece was, um, did anybody else notice about how many people had said that it was really intimidating? It's really hard when you first get started. It's intimidating and overwhelming when you first get started. And from a teacher's point of view, I think that that's one of the biggest hangups before somebody tries something even as simple as working with code.org is it's intimidating. I don't know how to program a computer. I don't know how to write a lot, write a, an app. And how am I going to get my students to do it? Um, and then the last piece that I really thought was great was how, how just in this chunk of the video, it really provided some opportunities for students to connect with things. Um, so this is definitely something that I would encourage you to um, preview with your students and, and really dive into just for the topic of computer science. So let's go ahead and we're going to start exploring the whys. Um, and when I look at state standards here in Minnesota, I have really never seen robotics programming or game design spelled out as exactly as that. And on our next slide, um, we are going to go ahead and take a look at a couple of statistics that we have um, listed here. So in 31 states in DC, computer science can actually be a piece of graduation standards. I know that when I graduated, I'm pretty young. I graduated out of uh, high school in 2005. I had a really challenging math class. I didn't do as well as I hoped. And for me to um, take another opportunity to continue learning in a different area of math, instead of continuing on a struggle, I decided to shift and take some computer science courses, which was great. Um, another statistic, and this is actually a statistic, you can um, jump onto code.org and they have proven this, that students like computer sciences a lot. Um, and I love this statistic because it, it, it isn't full of numbers and it's really full of truth. Um, the last one is that 67% of computing jobs are outside of the tech sector. I look at um, ed tech and this is a sector that's so diverse that some people may not consider this a tech sector at all. So looking on our next slide, we are going to have um, some great infographics from code.org really focusing on the hour of code. And when we look at our job gaps and how many students are actually going to fulfill the jobs that we currently have. One piece that we're not thinking of is that every year we're creating jobs that didn't exist the year before. And that when we continue to look at the students that I'm working with, even in a fifth grade class this year, when they're graduating, how many more jobs are we going to have 
that haven't existed because a new technology is formed or a new workflow is, is coming through that, that radically changes how we interact. Um, so that's uh, that one piece that I want us to continue, con continue to consider is that when we think about computer science, we're really looking at um, a very wide and open field that's, that's expanding every year. On our next slide, we've got an awesome statistic um, about our gender inequity. I um, just finished signing up a lot of my students on code.org, which is one of the resources that I'm going to touch base on. And um, in third through fifth grade, explaining male, female, gender, why we need to put that in our profiles um, is a great opportunity for us to talk about um, 10 years ago how it was not seen that girls would code at all. And coding used to be a boy's activity, just like we have other activities that are boy activities and girl activities. And now we know that's not true. We know that's one of those false truths that have been just mythicized all over the place. And when we look at our um, girls in computer science, we start looking at problem solvers that look at a problem from a different perspective. We look at people who can work together with others in a different way. And we really start to look at how we can take this gender gap and start fighting it in very early ages. Um, our next slide, we've got um, a great piece that really looks at our new ISTE um, standards. So on the right side of your screen, you're going to see the new ISTE standards. And for any of you that aren't familiar with ISTE, ISTE is the International Society for, Te for Technology and Education, um, ISTE.org. They have some great Twitter um, resources that they'll tweet out. They have an incredible set of standards. And these standards are really international um, standards that, that don't just relate to technology and education, but really relate to our our 21st century learners. And the 21st century skills I'm sure most of us have already found is create, collaborate, communicate, and critically thinking. Um, with this, we can take these skills and apply them in any content area. What we've got on our next slide is another awesome resource for some people looking maybe to find some, some opportunities to explain why computer science is important. This is P21. Um, the P21 framework takes our four C's, and takes a lot of other areas that may start to drift from a school because they are not tested at a state level, like life and career skills. Um, something where students aren't tested on that every year. Is that an area that schools could reduce budgets? Well, you can definitely um, bring up the P21 partnership and explain to administrators that this is an awesome resource for explaining why computer science, and not only why computer science, but why life skills. Why do we need somebody in our media center every day? Why do we need to integrate our 21st century themes into our key subjects? And why do we need to allow students to not only create and collaborate, but communicate out with the rest of the world and share? We'll go ahead and jump to our next slide. And I've got a big question. So we're going to go ahead and we are going to be pulling together into some small groups and do a partner chat. Um, and now that we discussed a couple of whys, to go ahead and think about um, what are two reasons that you're interested in bringing this type of, of work into your classroom, or what's one struggle that you're worried about overcoming. And then after just a few minutes of discussion, um, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and raise a couple of hands, and Mitch will pull somebody up on stage, and we'll go ahead and discuss that. So I promised you there would be an opportunity to interact. This is it. This is one of the opportunities. I'd like you to click on the avatar of another person and discuss uh, these questions with, with another person and see if you can get somebody else's perspective. Um, if you don't have a webcam and, uh, and a microphone, uh, you can uh, you know, put your comments into the IM window. Uh, if you don't have the IM window up, again, move your cursor over your avatar. You'll see that there's a an icon for IM. Uh, click on that and then you can. Okay. So it looks like uh, quite a few of you had a chance to do that. Uh, Dave, do you have a chance yeah, to talk to anybody? A couple great conversations. Um, if anybody wants to jump on stage, uh -huh. um, I was able to talk with Troy a little bit about um, some of the pieces that he is excited to learn and things that he wants to integrate. And then also that hurdle of um, the expense and that hurdle of, of not having that. Um, you know, knowledge. When I when I think about it, it's you know, 
there are certain topics that we can teach a day and a half of the student, a day and a half ahead of students, and there are certain topics that we need to know inside out. Um, and I hope to address a little bit of right. that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, maybe uh, if, uh, since nobody stepped forward, um, and Troy didn't step back, so I'm kind of hoping that maybe Troy mind if I bring him up. Bring Troy on up. Hello, everyone. So, Troy, did you want to just take a moment and explain a little bit better than what I did, um, what you had shared with me? Well, okay, so I teach eighth grade science in Los Angeles, California, and uh, my main, um, I guess, hang up or issue would be, uh, or fear, actually, would be that, uh, you know, I would find these great lessons, but I can't afford the gear in order to teach it, you know, uh, and I'm kind of, my dream is to find some, you know, inexpensive uh, uh, lessons that I could teach where we could actually build something, through, you know, some robotics, uh, and just, just every, even, even when I say it, it just sounds expensive. Like I could just hear like dollar signs in my ear, just saying I'm going to teach a lesson on robotics. Um, but you know, one of the things about uh, while I was watching uh, the viewer is that um, I could take a day and just teach code, you know. Uh, but then how do I get over the hurdle of me learning when I'm I only just know about it. I don't actually know how to code. Yeah, no, and um, I'm really looking forward to to touching base specifically on the two questions that you had brought up of what are some things that I can bring into my classroom that aren't high cost? Because when you hear computer science and you hear programming or robotics, you think of some of the really high level robotics pieces that maybe you'll get to at one point, um, but you want to start small and have a manageable piece. And then also that fear of not knowing how to code, not knowing how to program. And I'm really excited to share a resource with that. So everybody stay tuned with that. Troy, thank you so much for um, jumping up and being a great volunteer. Okay, so some of the what's. Um, I was trying to think about how to break down the what's. And the what's end up breaking down into we have hardware components, we have software components, and probably the most important, we have curriculum and lessons. And maybe the best word for this is maybe a scope and sequence, um, because you don't have to have curriculum and lessons, but you do need a scope and sequence. So. Um, if I were to revise that, and if you guys are, are thinking about an administrator, definitely change curriculum and lessons to scope and sequence. And when we look at these three, they all interact with each other. And in a perfect world, we could have all three working really well together. Um, and that may happen with all sorts of activities, but some of the activities may only have to do with a scope and sequence or curriculum and software, or they may only have to do with the curriculum and lessons and the hardware components. Um, if you are completely hands off, you might have that scope and sequence going where students have those full makerspace or full creator days where they're working with the software, the hardware, um, and, and don't have huge objectives and, and really allow for some creativity. We can go ahead and jump on to our next page and we are going to see that we um, have going to be talking about. And these what's are all fairly inexpensive. Um, we're going to be speaking about Ozobots a little bit. We're going to be speaking about Osmo, and specifically Osmo coding, um, Sphero, Ollie, and Parrot mini drones, and then also Bloxels, because I really think that some of the game design fits into this very well. Um, so each one of these slides, or each one of these topics is going to have just a little mini plug. Um, I do want to definitely disclose to you all that um, just like I work with ClassFlow, I also work um, a little bit as a teacher volunteer with Osmo and then also with Bloxels. Um, so we'll go ahead and jump on to our next slide. And we're going to take a moment to think about um, Ozobots here. Now, when we are thinking about our Ozobots, um, Ozobots are small and affordable robots. And these are perfect for um, classes from primary all the way to high school. One thing that's really interesting about Ozobots is that they literally fit in the palm of your hand. And I think that that's pretty clear in this image here. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but I know exactly how wide that tape is on the top of the Amazon box because I get them so frequently. And when we think about our Ozobots, um, they are um, just incredible to be able to use. Um, we can think about different ways to program these. And they have a very special language that's a color code. They also have custom in-app opportunities to 
um, pre-program them. And then they have something really awesome called Ozo Blockly. And Ozo Blockly was built right on um, Blockly, which was a Google side project. And that's a very visual um, and contextual based programming language where a student can take their um, fingers or take their mouse and drag in a block that that robot is going to do. Um, on our next screen, we've got um, a great piece. And I'm going to actually push this out on Classflow also. So let me stop and push that out quickly. Um, on the left side, we have a student explaining what their Ozobot track is. And on the right side, we have a student communicating their success with Ozobots. Um, last year, when I first rolled out Ozobots, I also rolled out something that's a very important topic to me, and that is the fact that we should be failing, but we should be failing forward. And we should be taking our little failures, and as long as we don't repeat them consistently because we're a stubborn failure, we are continuing going, then we can um, take a let me slide over something that just popped up. Um, we can take a failure and turn that into a learning opportunity. So go ahead and I'd now what's great about these um, two video resources is that they're very student based. Um, I hope that you guys had an opportunity to take a look at those. And I know that both Mitch, um, who is facilitating us tonight, he will be archiving this presentation. Um, and then I'll also be tweeting out the resource so that if any of you want to go back to any of these um, resources or links, you'll have it. Um, so let's go ahead and move on to our next screen. And when we are looking at um, our next tool, and, and I am going to be keeping up this clipping pace because I want to be respectful to our time, um, Osmo Coding. Um, Osmo is a highly interactive iPad accessory. So we can see that we have a base that the iPad is sitting in and then a red reflector mirror. And this red reflector mirror actually tilts where the camera is viewing. So it looks like we just lost Dave. And so Dave, if you're still here, um, maybe you can uh, raise your hand. Maybe, you're, uh, maybe you have to refresh, uh, but it looks like his, um, his connection just went down. Oh, okay, so he raised his hand. Uh, <coughs> Before I, I bring him up, I just you know I know there was a there's been a, a couple questions about about money, um, and I also do want to bring up there's a there's a website called Pledge Sense that allows you to um, you know to ask for your classroom, and um, I just I met the owner actually yesterday, so I don't know that much about the the website, but I will say that if you go to that web, website pledgesense.com uh, there's a contact us page, and if the owner's name is Andy, and if you say to Andy that Mitch suggested that you contact him, my guess is that he'll work with you. Uh, but anyhow, I'm definitely thanks for sharing that. Sorry about the little blip here. Um, since you did just have that little uh, note about raising some money, it looks like uh, Lisa had mentioned that you can also participate in a Khan Academy yearly hour of code which you can um, register to receive $100 per student that completes the Khan Academy Hour of Code. Um, so more students is more money. So that's something interesting. I'll definitely want to check that out. Um, so Lisa, thanks for sharing that out with us also. Um, so when we look at our Osmo coding, the biggest thing that I want to share here are pieces. And we can take coding, which is seen often as a very computer keyboard and mouse type of activity and break it down to a synthesis where our students ages 5 to 12 are really interacting with them. It's highly engaging. And, you know, I was a little reluctant to use this with my fifth graders because I thought it was going to be too kid friendly um, for them. And they said, Mr. Blanchard, we love this more than some of the other things that we've done because it's kind of fun in that just real youth centric way. Um, so Abby goes around and collects some strawberries and does some other activities. And Osmo provides this really awesome thing that I love about Osmo and all of the Osmo activities is they have corrective and supportive feedback that's all built within it. And they really focus on um, providing that in nonverbal ways. Um, so here we've got tangible blocks with block-based vis visual coding for our programming language. On our next screen, we're going to go ahead and take a look at probably one of the most used um, pieces of hardware in um, ed tech when we look at computer programming on the hardware side. And that would be this combination of Sphero, 
Ali or Parrot Mini drones. And using these tools um, is something that is relatively affordable. Each tool runs around the $100, $129 range. And this is a tool where I successfully use four of them in my classroom of up to 32 students at a time. And what's nice about this is students can actually work together to be able to um, solve some different simple challenges. Now, here again, I work with um, ages five through 11. Um, and the first challenge that I had was for the students to run our Sphero or our Ollie. And Sphero is a, the, the sphere, and then Ollie is the um, cylinder with two tires. And their challenge was just to draw a straight line that I had drawn on the floor. And that challenge had my students working on an app called Tickle, which we're going to talk about in just a couple minutes, over and over and over again, and getting really frustrated, but frustrated in a way that they were so proud when they overachieved their when they achieved their their goal. This is perfect for small group efforts or for single person coding. And what's nice about this is it works really well with a program called Tickle App. Tickle App is um, a mobile app. They are dabbling a little bit in Chrome. Um, but they haven't really launched into that much. Or you can use their branded apps. Sphero, Ollie, and Parrot all have branded apps that basically bring the RC car back onto your iPhone. And you can drive it just like a normal RC car. And to me, I don't value that nearly as much as I value the block-based programming and critical thinking that Tickle allows us to use. Um, on our next page, we are going to take a look at Bloxels. And Bloxels is a way for us to um, think about programming in a little bit different way. This highly interactive tool allows us to really design some video games. So here in the image that I pulled, you can see in the background we have um, a black board with a whole bunch of pixel-shaped um, colorful blocks. And what this is showing us is that the person holding the iPad actually took an um, image using the Bloxels app of that Bloxels board and you can see kind of on the right hand side of the screen, the little fire plant um, and that imported it directly into the game. Now, here is that just making a video game could be. But when we think about taking a step back and not just thinking, OK, are we playing a game or are we designing a game? Students are actually into design interactions, assigning buttons, assigning values and assigning different challenges. Um, you can also use this in digital storytelling for those teachers who are really interested in wanting to focus this into um, content areas. Bloxels is awesome for digital storytelling. Um, let's go ahead and jump on to our next page. And we're going to um, talk about code.org. And I wanted this to be one of our last slides on the, the what, because code.org is probably one of the most used and most valuable resources. Code.org actually has a team of facilitators who are all teachers that are teaching computer science in some way that will provide completely free training to any teacher. You get a swag bag. You get a full curriculum printed and updated. You get professional development hours. And the best thing of all is you get to experience what your students experience, and you get to um, mimic teaching it. It is a seven-hour training, but my goodness, it was the best training that I went to all year. Um, here we've got some scaffolded and supported projects. So teachers that are timid on working with code can use code.org in multiple numer in numerous different ways. Um, there is a full teacher dashboard. And the best part about this is that you can enable sign in with Google. So if you are a G Suite or a GAF school, you can use your Google Apps username and password. And your students can log in and join classes where you can not only progress monitor what they're doing, but you can also pair them with another person in the class to do some partner coding. There's all sorts of options to create additional art and custom apps. There's abilities to share the projects, and um, it is a web-based piece. So you can use it on an iPad, on a Chromebook, on a whatever you have that connect to the internet. Let's go ahead and jump on to our next page. Um, Tickle is going to be an awesome resource that I want to just touch base on. It's a visual block. It's also something that um, if you have older students and you want them programming text language, it uses Swift 3, which is um, the fastest growing um, language around right now. It offers both supported and scaffolded projects. The link here does provide some introductory courses so that anybody who is interested in using it can jump right in. And then you can also have all sorts of device sensors, both on the iPad if you're using an iPad, or on the sensors 
um, from an Arduino or a um, Sphero, and I put Sphere there, excuse me, you can um, share these projects. And then one nice thing is since it's app-based, it works with and without Wi-Fi. Um, let's go ahead and jump on to our next piece. Um, I do want to answer a quick question by Brad. Um, you can use drones for robotics. I, you have a DJI Inspire, and I'm not familiar with that particular um, brand, um, but if it gets minimal use, you can definitely have some pieces to engage with it. Um, Brad, if you would um, follow me on Twitter and direct message me, I will absolutely um, dig into that myself and take a look at that. And then, Mitch, let's go ahead and jump this, um, these two screens. I just wanted to show an illustration of what this is like. Um, so Tickle is very visual, but also something that's really easy to support. Um, the next piece that what would be Scratch or Scratch Junior. Um, this was developed by the MIT Media Lab and also Tufts University. It's a visual block-based language. It's got scaffolded and supported projects, an easy ability to share, and it has these awesome little custom on-screen character, characters called sprites. This is something that is web-based if you use Scratch, and Scratch is perfect for students third grade and up. Otherwise, Scratch Junior is an app-based that works with or without Wi-Fi. Scratch Junior is perfect for um, students five and up. And then the PBS version of Scratch, and PBS Kids um, partnered with Scratch to create one that was completely custom skinned. So instead of moving around the little cat that I have on the screen, you can move around the PBS Kids characters. Um, they um, are targeted more towards our early learners in pre-K and primary. Um, Scratch and Scratch Junior is an incredible tool because it allows students to create some options in that same way that an older student might be able to drive around a robot. Being able to use on-screen and in real life tools allows our students to see that programming can have real impacts, but it can also be that digital tool. Let's go ahead and jump to our next page. Um, I've got some curriculum ideas here. Um, this is one of the pieces that I wanted to provide mainly as a resource. So we have code.org, we have Scratch Ed, we have uh, Code Academy and Khan Academy, and then we have Code HS. And when we look at these different curriculum ideas, I'm not going to jump into each one of these heavily. And I wanted to provide these as an overall um, piece for those of you who are looking for that thing to grab and look into um, on your own. With only an hour that we have tonight, um, and such a huge topic, I wanted to definitely showcase a couple of things that actually work and that I've done in class. What's nice about everything that we've talked about so far up to this page, because I've used code.org and Scratch, but not the other three resources as much, is that when we are using tools that other teachers who have full workloads can integrate into their classrooms or design meaningful experiences with, we can take that sigh of relief and know, you know, Dave is not just a teacher who teaches only robotics and that's what he has his degree in. I've got a degree in elementary ed and a degree in science education for K-8 um, and then a master's in instructional design, which has nothing to do with robotics or programming. I am one of these teachers who is just like you who was ready for a change in my classroom and knew that this would be an awesome opportunity and I just happened to be shifting from a classroom teacher uh, to a specialist teacher when I made this change. So definitely take these curriculum ideas and I really want to give a huge shout out to code.org because they are probably one of the most pinnacle resources that teachers can can go to because they support teachers um, that just want to do an hour a year to teachers who want to take a curriculum and use it an hour every day if you have that much flexibility. I don't, but um, if you do have that flexibility, you sure can. Um, we'll jump to our next slide. And when we look at code.org, um, what's so neat about this is they have courses for beginning readers. These are readers that don't have mouse skills yet even. And code.org is designed lessons to build in those mouse skills without any reading. And it goes all the way up through high school students and developing their own apps in the app lab. This introduces and practices real life pro programming skills that really allows students to not only see that programming can be fun, but that programming can be difficult. Um, highly engaging, super interactive, fun games that are always thematically appropriate. Um, two years ago, they launched Frozen for their hour of code. 
Um, this year, or last year, they launched Star Wars for the Hour of Code. Um, the hint is both of those were huge motion pictures for the year. Um, and this year, they're going to be launching Hour of, a Code, Hour of Code again during Computer Science Education Week, which is the, usually the second week um, in December. I want to say it's like December 5th through 12th. Um, so look for a new set of activities there. Um, students can build, run, and share actual programs. Um, this includes the design of some different really neat art projects. I had a student create an incredible um, spirograph styled art project. And he's like, oh my gosh, I wish I could print this out. And we all know printing in color, once you have one student print, everybody wants to print. Um, and what I found within with code.org was that he could share that with his mom by text message because it's built in with code.org. Um, there's also integrated corrective and supportive feedback. Um, a couple of the themes that I hit tonight really had to do with corrective and support. Not only correcting a student that did something um, wrong in their program, but also supporting them as they work um, is really important to really foster some awesome skills. Let's go ahead and jump to our next piece. Here we go. I was thinking our big question is coming up soon. So our next big question is, um, going to be a couple minute discussion again with a partner so you'll be jumping into um, partner groups by clicking on the avatar of somebody that you um, don't know um, and i want you just to think have you already integrated any of these tools or think about how you could in implement one or more of these pieces into um, into your classroom Okay, so here's a uh, second chance for you to interact with the people here. Um, just click on the avatar of another person in your room, and I'll actually shrink this so you can see them. And let's discuss, uh, do you currently have access to any of the mention tools uh, before? And how could you implement more aspects of computer science into your classroom? I'll pull myself down to, okay, Dave. Um, so you've, you had a chance to talk to a couple of people I saw. Yeah, I did have a chance to talk to a couple people. If anybody would like to volunteer um, to raise their hand and share something else that they learned, um, Susan and I had discussed a couple of awesome um, resources to purchase, so maybe not something that we'd share as a group. Um, but if anybody else is interested in um, sharing, otherwise we can jump to our last couple of slides also. Okay, and I'm kind of hoping that uh, Terry... Yeah. Um, because Terry I had Terry some good... popped up a message. Um, so um, actually, so I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to pull myself down and let's just see if we can bring Terry, uh, Terry up. Hey, Terry, how are you? It sounds like Terry is muted for me. Can any Terry? Can you? Um... Right. I could. Unfortunately, I couldn't hear her either. Um, she's been uh, typing into the IM box, um, but I guess uh, unfortunately does not have audio. So, I, so even though we could see her, uh, we couldn't hear her. But she's had some. Uh, she has some great comments through questions, um, and uh, you know, as, as you know, I I don't actually see the uh, the text box. So, um, oh, she brought up, uh, she, she actually says she uses everything. She uses bots, she uses Ozobot, she uses uh, um Boy, it'd be great to, to get her up at some point to, to talk to us, maybe on a future yeah. session that we do on robotics. Kind of a, yeah, absolutely. In an early, like a primary and elementary building, primary and mm -hmm. intermediate. Um, those are all awesome resources. That's awesome. So, okay. Um, so, so let, why don't I bring your... Perfect. Well, one thing that I always know that I enjoy getting from um, conferences and ed chats are resources. 
So I met with um, one of my colleagues and somebody who I work with pretty closely with Classflow and Mitch and kind of said, how should I end this? And I wanted to end this with things that you could click and learn more. Of your screen, you're going to see a couple of um, videos and articles that are awesome resources, um, some of the resources that we already used. Um, so definitely don't click on these quite yet. Um, on the right side of your screen, you're going to just see or curriculum sites for all of the um, tools that, that I mentioned or, or some of the big tools that I mentioned. If you are interested in um, using Bloxels in your classroom, that was the interactive video game design um, that really focused on creativity and critical thinking. Um, I have a promo code for you. So it's my last name, Blanchard, and then EDU. And if you put that promo code in, and then um, there's a drop down saying, how'd you learn about Bloxels? And you just say, I learned about it from an ambassador or at a conference. And then you can put my, my last name or my Twitter handle, or you can just write Dave, um, but use that promo code and you'll be able to get free shipping up to $50 off your order. Um, Bloxels has an awesome education program where they do bundles um, to really get you some nice discounts. So this slide is something that we're going to tweet out and make sure that other people can get a hold of so that all of these links are resources that you can use. Um, definitely, if you have any questions about these, please reach out to me on Twitter. And um, also, when you're reaching out to me on Twitter, if you wanted to know more about Osmo, make sure that you either hashtag Osmo or you um, tweet at Play Osmo. Same thing with Ozobot, Code, Sphero, Scratch, any of these tools, because they will all get back to you also. I, I tweet out just as a teacher, and they get back to me fairly often. Um, on our next slide, I've got um, just a piece that is a little bit about me. Um, this is something where if you want to get a hold of me in the future, um, I definitely made sure that I would send this out to somebody. My Twitter handle is right there, um, my website. And then if you go to connect.30dave.com, um, you'll have an awesome Google form just going through figuring out if there's a specific thing that you want to connect with me about, um, either um, doing a blended session with your school, um, having a one-on-one -on -one training session, or um, if you're in the area, having me come out to your school, um, I, I definitely work with people on that. Um, the different companies that I really work with quite a bit um, are tools that I used in my classroom first. Osmo, Remind, Classflow, Docent EDU, and Bloxels are all tools that I use in the classroom. And that is what they were for me first. And I continued to have this little fire of passion about these products grow because they sparked something interesting. Osmo allows us to use things in a tangible way. Remind allows us to succeed together and connect in, in incredible ways by text messaging parents and keeping communication safe. Classful allows us to, you know, if any of you are on Glassflow right now, allows us to have this highly interactive um, piece between students and teachers and have all sorts of different resources shared between us. Um, Docent EDU is an awesome tool for anybody who wants to augment the internet into their own lessons in their own textbook. And Bloxels is that incredible game design tool. Our next slide um, into B, oh, maybe this is our last slide, excuse me. This is our last slide. Um, so on Classful, you're going to see just a quick little question that I threw up. And um, I've got a poll because I did want to show you some different um, neat pieces about Classflow. So the 15 of you who are on Classflow, you should see um, kind of a Likert scale style um, bar across the bottom of your screen. If you're not on Classflow, I can at least show you what it looks like. Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, so we have um, our question and our Likert scale. And you can go ahead and spat back, back to me. Um, so I see that yeah, uh, five of the 10 people, and um, it keeps counting down on the teacher side. Um, how many students are remaining. So I've got nine students remaining. I think I'm one of the students. So we have eight students remaining. Um, Classful allows us to really bring a new piece of interaction to the classroom. The way that I used it here today was incredibly simple. Um, and the reason why is because it wasn't the highlight of today. I really wanted to highlight some opportunities for us to talk about um, looking at how we value computer science and highlighting some specific tools that we use. Um, the last piece I want to um, show you is on Classflow, you're going to notice 
um, that there is one more call to attention that if you do um, want to get a hold of me and even ask some questions um, to jump on and continue to look at um, Twitter as we continue to learn together. So thank you everybody for everything that we've talked about tonight. Um, I had some awesome discussions. Troy, Susan, uh, Brad, thank you for your contributions and discussions with me and I'm looking forward to connecting with more people in the future. Thank, thanks, thank you. Thank you for, um, you know, for, uh, I guess, taking an hour that you could be spending with your uh, newborn baby and, and your wife and uh, teaching us. And maybe, um, you know, maybe uh, the, in the spring or, or early winter, uh, we could do a series of sessions where we could delve into these in greater, greater depth. And if we did it as a series, then we could have, um, you know, through class, uh, maybe we can have a, a group where we could all learn together. So, you no, know, I think that would, be an, that would be an awesome opportunity. Highlight maybe one or two tools each time instead of mm -hmm. the 10 or 15 that we looked at today. Yeah, yeah that would be interesting. Okay, well, we'll, we'll talk further. And, um, you know, and, and, and thanks again. And uh, I'll, 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 I'll see you soon. And, okay, uh, and for, for everybody else, uh, I guess we're, we're coming to a close. It's, it's after 9 o'clock. And uh, you can now uh, turn to the World Series. I'm not going to be a spoiler. I'm not going to tell you the score. So if you've recorded it and you want to start from the beginning, uh, go ahead. In the meantime, I hope to see you next week. We have two sessions next week, which and they, they should be really interesting. And uh, one more question um, was, will there be a recording of this? Yes. Not only will there be a recording of this, <coughs> so that any of the links you'll be able to get to. Thank you, Cecilia, for reminding me. And uh, this is Mitch Weisberg uh, signing off for EdChat Interactive and hope to see you all soon. Good night.